Okay, good morning and welcome and thank you for joining us here on this Monday morning. My name is John Copps and I'm from Mutual Ventures and I'll be guiding today's conversation, looking at some of the questions and concerns that we've heard from local authorities over the last three weeks around the Department for Education's Fostering Recruitment and Retention Programme. So I'll be joined by my, my colleagues in a minute, Mark Owers and Anya Kemble. But before then, I just wanted to bring us back to the purpose of this programme. So increasing the availability of foster carers in your areas and providing more loving homes for our most vulnerable children. Fostering recruitment hubs should be a centrally run front door across your cluster and cover foster carers journey from initial inquiry through to application. So with a single point of contact for those inquiring to foster and then ongoing emotional and practical advice on the approval process. All the issues we're going to look at today are those that you've raised with your coaches. And we've called this session myth, myth busting, but we'll draw on a lot of the information gathered to date from your clusters, from knowledge from the northeast you've got going ahead of everybody else, and then relevant experience from other programs such as the Regional Adoption Agencies program. If you have any questions um, during this session, please use the Q&A function at the bottom to submit them, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. And any we don't get to, we can answer after the session and share a copy with you afterwards, along with the recording. So let me now turn to our panellists who will introduce themselves. Good morning, Mark. Uh, morning, John. Uh, morning, Anya, and morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, my name's Mark Owers. Um, uh, some of you will... Um, I've got the list of attendees in front of me, so I may know some of you. Uh, so good to be in front of you that I know and good to meet those that I don't, and I look forward to supporting you on this journey. So uh, I was the co-author of the 2018 review of the foster care system in England with Sir Martin Neri. Uh, I'm the chair of the National Adopter Recruitment Steering Group, uh, former director of children's services in Jersey, uh, also the former uh, chief executive of the consortium of voluntary adoption agencies, which, um, as many of you all know, are independent agencies that specialise in a specific route to permanence adoption in this instance. Uh, I was previously um, a national director with Foster Care Associates, uh, helping to deliver um, fostering services uh, to over 50 local authorities in London, the South East and the South West. So, I have a lot of experience of the independent sector. Um, and I suppose most relevant uh, to this uh, is I led the regional adoption agency leaders for five years um, as they set up the 32 regional adoption agencies across England. So uh, hopefully I've got something to add. Thanks, Mark. Morning, everyone. Um, again, I can't see who's here, but I'm sure I've spoken to some of you. Um, so I'm Anya Kemble. I'm a senior consultant for Mutual Ventures. Um, I'm working with two of the regions and supporting them to get their bid in, and then we'll be working with you throughout the duration of the programme. Um, and I'm also the learning lead for the programme, so managing the relationship um, with colleagues in the northeast to understand their reflections and learnings to date. So hopefully I'll be able to bring some of that in as well today. Thank you, Anya. Thank you, Mark. So everyone, we've, as I said, we've, we've decided to orientate this session around some myths that we've heard or, or some questions and concerns we've heard from you. And we sort of formatted them in the, in the way of myths. So I have them here in front of me, just so you know what's coming up. Um, le and let me just go through them. So we'll be, so these have all come from you. So a regional recruitment hub will just be a call center. There isn't benefit to regionalizing recruitment for local authorities already recruiting adequate numbers of foster carers. The burden on the lead local authority will outweigh the benefits. We'll look at that. The hub will impact the hard won individual local authority reputations. Is that true? Setting up a regional recruitment hub will threaten existing staff jobs. These are questions you've asked. And regional recruitment hubs are not a sustainable model for recruitment. And number seven, once we submit our bids, nothing can be changed. So there, that's... That will be our agenda. So before we go into that, I just want to ask Mark and Anya a quick question, because there's uncertainty when you start programmes like this. 
and and it's understandable people have questions so what's your overall advice to colleagues joining on how to think about this opportunity and what they should do to manage the uncertainty perhaps mark you want to go uh thank you uh, i don't suppose there's any better profession than social care to manage uncertainty so uh, i would draw upon all the skills experience and knowledge that you have in helping to support families to do their very best for their children uh, and within that uh, i would ask you to uh, or uh, uh, encourage you to keep an open mind um, again just draw parallels from when you're looking for the strengths in families that we work with and the strengths in foster carers and adopters um, that we work with uh, remain positive uh, stay as positive uh, as you can and think about the ways in which you do that as an individual, um, as teams uh, within your programme management, but critically across projects. Um, and we'll come to that, I would have thought, in some of the answers to um, the, uh, the myths. Um, this is an opportunity. Uh, of course, it's a threat and there will be strengths and there will be weaknesses, but make the most of the opportunity. Um, Think about what you are brilliant at and keep that at the fore. Because every authority in a cluster is brilliant at lots of things and collectively you're all brilliant at everything. So how do you just bring the brilliance to the fore and keep it there? Um, and I would ask you to keep foster carers at the centre. Um, we talk about children all the time and rightly so in children's services and keeping them at the centre. Uh, but I think foster carer recruitment can be significantly improved if we put foster carers at the centre and we fully understand their needs and we meet their needs alongside understanding and meeting the needs of children. That's great, Mark. And I'm sure we'll come to some of those. So some of those issues. And yeah, how what advice would you give about dealing with this opportunity and some of the uncertainty around it? Yeah, I mean, firstly, I'd say uh, Mark kind of took the words out of my mouth. I was going to say this is an opportunity and it's I think um, it's going to be challenging. It's going to be difficult. And that's part of doing work like this and trying to do something um, differently. But I think see it as that opportunity, see it as an opportunity to take what you do, do really well in your regions and kind of harness that and an opportunity to address things you want to improve or, you know, you can do better. Um, and I think in terms of the uncertainty, I mean, it's it's cliche, but it is going to be difficult. And that's just part and parcel of doing this work. Um, I suppose we're here as coaches to support you and help you to work through some of those challenges. But also, you know, you'll you'll do this all the time. You'll work through challenges in your authorities and across your regions. That's why you've kind of you've got that partnership working. So I think it's it's acknowledging it's going to be hard. It's focusing on the fact that this is meant to be an iterative process and it is based around what what works and what doesn't and when you know you're not going to get everything right the first time um but I think yeah learning from kind of the challenges and, and building and improving is really important so I think in a way you've kind of got to embrace the, the uncertainty but you've got those strong relationships across your regions and that's why um, you're all working together to kind of tackle that. Right. So let's get into the myths then. So some of those things that we started for. So the first one was a regional recruitment hub is just a call centre. Who wants to respond to that one? I can I can start us off if it's helpful. Um, so I think the best thing about being part of this programme is that this is an opportunity to shape your regional recruitment hub to the needs of your region and the challenges you know you're facing. Um, I think this is, it's much more than a call centre because this is about foster carers having ongoing support, like John said at the beginning, from the, the kind of initial inquiry through to a decision being made on their application. So I think thinking a lot more about what support foster carers need, what will help them understand the process. And as Mark said, putting them at the centre of this. Um, this is about doing something different differently. It's not about kind of implementing the same things. And I think just thinking about what we've heard from the Northeast, for example, um, as part of their recruitment hub, they're going to be delivering training across the region. So really making sure that foster carers are getting a consistent experience. Um, they're being well prepared. They understand what kind of will be required of them. Um, 
They're also going to be operating a buddy scheme across the region. So this is all coming out of their recruitment hub. So, it's you know, you really can shape it into something so much more. And it should be an absolute ambition for it to be much more uh, than a call centre, because otherwise I don't think you'll, you'll really see that change. But as the Northeast launch next month, we can kind of start to understand how that's working and what the experience of foster carers are like. But I definitely would challenge you all to think much further and much more beyond um, kind of than just seeing it as a kind of initial conversation. Mark, do you want to respond to that? So the the, the program has said that um, these regional recruitment hubs should be a central front door for a cluster of local authorities. So what's to stop them just being a call centre? Uh, well, if we think about them as call centres, they'll be call centres. So um, they aren't supposed to be call centres. Uh, and I think um, the level of ambition each cluster has is really important. What's the vision? Uh, and for me, uh, the vision has to be about um, improving the experiences end to end of those that want to foster and who go on to have successful fostering careers. Um, and I don't think there's anything more important than that initial conversation, that initial contact. People don't wake up and say, hmm, what shall I do today? Um, I'm going to be a foster carer uh, or I'm going to be an adopter where we draw some of the um, parallels. Uh, people think about this long and hard over many months, sometimes over many years, uh, as they wait for their children to get older, uh, when relationships break down in terms of their own lives. Um, so when they make that first inquiry, it is absolutely critical that uh, the people handling that inquiry are at their very best and at their very best every single time they do that inquiry. And in, the, in answering that inquiry, we must have an eye to the end-to-end -end journey. We must understand it thoroughly from beginning to end. Uh, so it isn't about a kind of a, a one-stop shop where we're passing someone on to the next person. It is about the front part of the journey being much more sophisticated and consistent than it is perhaps at the moment across um, uh, areas for people to have a wonderful first experience and then to be contained and held in a really supportive way uh, to then go through uh, preparation, assessment and approval um, in the ways in which each area want to design. Um, the opportunity, I think, for making that first experience better and then holding people, um, I think, is wonderful. And I think we've had a comment through, actually, which reflects what you've just said, Mark, that we need a person centred, individual, personalised approach to to prospective foster carers. And the question really is who sets and agrees the vision. And I think that's for that's that's locally. That needs to happen locally because it needs to fit what you need in your area. Should we move on to our second myth? So that is. There isn't a benefit to regionalising recruitment for local authorities who are already recruiting adequate numbers of foster carers. What do you? What would you say to that, Mark? Uh, so I've heard that myth before. Uh, we said that, uh, we heard that a lot, rather, uh, in 2016 or there or thereabouts from uh, the 152 adoption agencies uh, across the country. Um, uh, but when people started to think about how they could share their best practice and their best ideas uh, and the way in which they've been able to do it in a very giving, compassionate, kind way, what we saw were the best bits of each of those agencies coming together into what is typically kind of six authorities in an RAA. Um, and it was very much about uh, those that were doing less well, learning for those that were doing better. And it was about everybody being as good as the best um, and for the best not to be leaving people behind as they had done for years. We had LAs in the RA world who were really good at particular types of adopters for children typically waiting longer, uh, black children, for example, and an authority right next to them were doing really badly. Uh, well, why weren't we able to share that previously um, and how do we do that nationally 
Uh, so for me, it's very much about um, having a much more open sharing and giving approach as authorities and putting support and money and processes on the table that help you to share more easily than you've been able to in the past. Mm -hmm. Anya, what's your view on, on the benefits? I think ultimately, I think the, the biggest benefit I can think of is even if you are doing things well in your region, this is an opportunity to bring all local authorities in the region up to the same level and to really learn from best practice, learn what's working well and make sure that there's a consistent experience. So I think it's it's less about thinking about what you might not get from it and more thinking about kind of similar to what Mark said, how you bring everybody along to collectively on the journey and how if you are doing certain things well such as recruit recruitment or retention of foster carers actually how do you share that best practice so that other local authorities in your region can do that well too um a couple of other things i'd say just remembering it's an end-to-end -end program so it's not just about recruitment it's also about that kind of comms piece and how people will um, hear about fostering and then also that retention piece so you might be an authority that recruits quite quite well but actually what's the holistic experience of a foster carer how do they feel and how well do you know how foster carers feel because I think it's easy to focus on what we do well sometimes it's quite challenging to uh, to think about what we could be doing better um, and the last thing I'd say is this is an opportunity to design a recruitment hub around the needs of of your region so there might be specific challenges or specific young people um that you're you're struggling to match with um the right foster carers um this is an opportunity for you to kind of build something that meets that need and supports foster carers and young people so i'd really just again see it as an opportunity and and a positive thing you can get involved in and and, and anya just to add to that um i think it's a really helpful advice um the way in which within a cluster you're able to specialize in a way that you can't when you have to do everything as a single agency. So how collectively you think about particular types of foster carers from particular communities, whether that's from the black community or from the LGBTQ plus community, the way in which you understand the needs of children with disability, where you may only have three or four or 10, suddenly you've got 20 or 25 or 30 of those children or 40 of those children. So the way in which you come together to think about your recruitment campaigns uh, child specific recruitment uh, but also the way in which you work with other clusters is an important part of this it isn't just about local authority and your own cluster of six or there, that, thereabouts but it's how you come together with other hub leaders to understand um, what others are doing learning from them and problem solving together as well as in the future and we'll come on to this I, I would imagine again in a minute how you collectively influence government and other providers outside of the local authority, because there will be much more togetherness in fostering uh, than there is at the moment, as we've seen in adoption. Thanks, Mark. Actually, there's a question that's gone in, come in that you might, you might have thoughts on, which is from the RAA programme. Can best practice be agreed by a committee of 10 local authorities without it being watered down to the point that best practice is lost to make a practical way forward? That is uh, a great question um, and has run throughout the RIA programme. Uh, this, this thing that we call practice wisdom, which isn't in national standards, uh, it isn't in research. Um, you can't always pin it down, but everybody has a view on the best way of doing something. My advice is never to push that. It will come. You will find your way together. Um, and it's, I think, inherent in the way in which local authorities have always worked and indeed the way the legislation makes local authorities be individual, the way in which local autonomy works with um, uh, uh, the democracy of how local government works, the way in which you can't cross fund local authorities in legislation. And that is that each local authority thinks they do it in their own way. What this programme must do is cherish and celebrate individual local authority working and take the best of that in a collaborative way. But it cannot be forced. It will come naturally with practitioners who are open to learning 
but who ultimately will have to go through the storming, forming, norming and performing bit of coming together in a different way and agreeing these sometimes difficult ways of changing practice. Yeah. And my, my involvement in the in the regional adoption agency programme and other regional work kind of suggests it's all about, so we can talk about governance here and it being um, having a, having the right structures to, to enable this collaboration, but really it's all about relationships in the end. And it's about, um, I, I suppose we're not saying any of this is easy. It isn't. But it's about getting together and, and and finding the best way for you locally and for the way that you work together as, as local authorities. So let's move on to the next myth. So we've got um, maybe we take myth three and myth four together. So one of those is the burden on the lead local authority will outweigh the benefits. And the other one is the regional recruitment hub will impact hard won local authority reputations. And yeah, have you got thoughts on either of those? I have, yeah. I mean, I'd say on the, the lead local authority one, um, firstly, DFE are recognising the role that the lead local authority has to play. Uh, so you'll be getting additional funding to recognise that um, and to cover the kind of, I suppose, driving uh, the the programme across the region. Um, but I also think it's important to think about the role you can play as a lead local authority in really driving change, in driving innovation. Um, so when we spoke to the North East Together for Children, who are the lead local authority in the North East, they were really clear that they recognised the need to innovate, the need to do different do things differently, and they wanted to be the authority that, that was driving that across the region. So I think... Um, as John said, not this isn't going to be easy. I don't think it's meant to be easy, but there is a real opportunity as the lead local authority to make sure that that kind of innovation is being driven across the region. Um, and I'd also think about, you know, there is important development opportunities for staff. This is a great programme to be part of. Um, so there's also those opportunities within your authority. Um, and also ultimately it is a, a collective, you're a region working together. So whilst the lead local authority will be playing a really important role in driving that change, everyone's got to come on that journey for it to be successful. Um, and then just on the kind of, I suppose, individual local authority reputations, um, it's definitely something I've heard in conversations. I think it's about bringing everyone up to that higher standard, as I said, but also not about taking away from the good work that local authorities do do or their identities. Um, but I ultimately think this is, you know, you're driving how you want these recruitment hubs to look to suit your needs in your regions. So ultimately, it's about taking that regional approach, but also, you know, you have the ability to design that and make sure that also aligns with, with what what, what works at the moment in your regions and, and your individual local authorities. So I think, again, seeing it as an opportunity, but also, you know, recognising it's in your hands to drive how you want it to look, but, you know, still meeting those DfE requirements. So ultimately, you can make sure that it does work for your regions. Mm -hmm. So, M Mark, the, the burden on the lead, lead local authority will outweigh the benefits. Is that a myth? Uh, it is a myth, yes. Um, and we have proof of that in the RIA world. Um, but of course, it depends on how you lead. <laughs> uh, this is about leading collaborative working. This is about doing stuff together in a relational, strengths-based, trusting way. Uh, some clusters will have more inherent trust and earned trust than others. Um, we saw um, in the RIA programme that um, Yorkshire and Humber, for example, the leads led which was the first to cross the line, um, they had a long history of working together um, and were used to having difficult conversations with each other in a supportive way. Uh, that made a big difference. Then they, they progressed quicker. They could get through some of the tricky things quicker. Um, but what's really interesting about the RA programme that will uh, no doubt be relevant to this is we inadvertently introduced a new cadre of leaders in children's social care. Um, and the RA leaders weren't quite heads of service and they weren't quite ADs. Uh, and they sat somewhere in the middle. And it was obviously different in different areas, depending on the structures. And some were lower and some were higher than that. But, but essentially, we were asking them to work with uh, six DCSs, six ADs, six agency decision makers, uh, uh, all of the different partners um, around that 
um, with varying levels of performance and Ofsted judgment differences and different funding agreements. Um, and it requires quite a skill set that didn't exist at the start. So the way in which DFE understand that is really important. The way in which uh, Mutual Ventures and us understand that in terms of how we provide support to you is really important, but also the way in which you as individual leaders and, and, uh, and, and managers understand it's important for the type of support you're going to need and the type of support and challenge that you're going to give and receive as part of this program. But there's no doubt in my experience across the RIA program that it's a real privilege to lead these hubs. It's not always easy, but um, you're at the forefront of doing things differently and critically, and this goes back to the myth about it's only going to be a call centre. This is an opportunity to do things differently in fostering, to take the best of what works, but also to stand outside of the way in which we've always done it and to use this as a way of putting foster carers at the centre, co-producing things with foster carers, really listening to them without the confines of delegate authority, whether they can or can't do this, that or the other and stat reviews, but saying, how do we make this work for you? And how do we put you at the center and keep you at the center and not just swan up when we want to, because we're used to and we have statutory rights and we need to see the child and all of which is really important. But often the regulatory framework encourages us, indeed forces us as statutory staff to ride roughshod over foster carers. We don't like doing it, but we find ourselves doing it. So how do we, as the lead authority, together with our partners, kind of just make the best use of this? It's it, What a wonderful chance. Thanks, Mark. And I think that issue about um, being able to focus on the foster carer is something we'll pick up um, in a later event and, and indeed something that you may well pick up with with local authorities as the, as as we go through the program um the fourth myth which annie has already um uh commented on the regional recruitment hub will impact hard won local authority reputations anything to add on that well i just think it's the, the answer we i gave earlier around this being about giving this being about sharing, this being about much more open. Um, there was a large local authority that we worked with in the RA programme in the South um, that was outstanding in all areas, uh, had great recruitment and retention, um, was very involved in national leadership work. But there are authorities around there much smaller that were struggling and they were often in their shadow. Um, and actually... On a Friday night, they were. it was easier for them to outbid the other authorities when they were trying to find care settings for children when it's most hard to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, when you say, can you not kind of help them a bit more? Can you not be a bit more understanding of their circumstances? Can you not give some of your scale and some of your resource to help others? Um, and so the way in which you share and um, harness reputation to bring others up to the best and how you yourselves continuously improve, uh, I think is um, a real benefit of this way of working. Yeah. And I think, I think the point, if this is done in right, right, everyone wins. And I think, but I, I appreciate saying that that's quite, that's a bit of a sort of bland statement and I, we know it will take real, it will take a lot of hard work to get there. So I think I think this is an opportunity, isn't it? And it's an opportunity. An opportunity is always what you make of it, really. And, and critically, John, around that, again, learning from the RA programme and, and other change programmes, we have to create spaces for each other to vent, to be able to say, my DCS, their DCS, that fostering manager, that ADM, this, that and the other, and it's getting too much for me. And to facilitate spaces that allow for that type of space, but also um, to problem solve together, to share best practice, to share learning, um, and to go on that journey together so that it feels like we're making a difference for the better, as opposed to how often it feels in an individual authority 
that you're getting drowned out by all of the change initiatives, by everything that's going on. Uh, so how can we, as a delivery partner, help to make this different and to make the most of the opportunities you say, John? Yeah, yeah. So let's move on to the fifth myth. So we've got we, we've got another three to get through. Um, so this this we've been asked this a few times. So setting up a regional recruitment hub will, will people have used different language, but will threaten existing job staff jobs. Now, is that is that true or not, Anya? Um, no, I don't think so. And I think actually um, it's interesting to think about how you might be able to bolster capacity where you don't have that in authorities. Um, so important to say, you'll maintain your statutory duty. So this isn't about um, passing over those statutory duties. So local authorities will still be uh, doing things like assessments. So you'll still need your staff to do that. Um, but I think also when we were asking the Northeast um, about this, the key point, which I thought was quite interesting that th they made was actually, this, this program's about additionality. So it's not about taking away the focus is about um, doing things better and DfE have recognized that by funding it. So um, I think that's a that's an interesting point to think about. And then the other the other point the Northeast also made was some smaller local authorities across the region, for example, didn't have dedicated fostering communication staff. Um, and actually this was an opportunity for them to fund someone dedicated focusing on that um, and to kind of yeah really put some um, some thought behind that so i think also there is an opportunity um to to bolster roles where like smaller local authorities or across your region there's not been the kind of um resource and funding to do that thanks anya and so what about mark any thoughts on that the the i mean maybe it's not a threat it's an impact it's change it, in, so that, yeah that's exactly what i was going to say so i mean given the number of vacancies up and down the country um there's enough jobs to go around um, for everyone in, in this space, um, probably twice over in some areas. Um, but there will be job role and responsibility changes for some, um, which I think is really exciting. And if you understand kind of your workforce and who's up for new opportunities um, and you kind of uh, enable choice in those in that, in that decision making and planning, then um, that can actually unlock some of some of the inertia that you you might have in some of these areas and actually give people a new lease of life. Um, and I think, as Anya said, uh, inevitably there are some authorities that haven't been um, fully resourced um, with the right specialisms, um, where you will have uh, a whole range of services um, and support services on offer in a way that you wouldn't always in some of the smaller to medium sized authorities. Uh, but uh, let, let, let's let's be really clear. And I think of all the myths, this is the one that um, there is an element of myth uh, that isn't able to bust, which is there will be an impact on some employees. Um, and whether that's about wearing a new, a new lanyard or having to travel an extra half an hour to a different office or having to use a different IT system, these things have a material impact on people's well-being and how they feel about going to work. And as in any change programme, if we shortchange the support around what it means for individuals and how they feel about being at work, then it will drag the programme back. I think that's really helpful, Mark. Yeah, change is, I mean, change is an opportunity, but it. we know that change needs managing and people don't always like change. And I think, again, this is an opportunity and it it it, it, it depends how you see it and how you manage it. But certainly there's things you can do at, 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 this is things you can do at scale that perhaps you couldn't have done before. So there may well be new roles. There may be, be new things that you, you need to do in this hub. Our sixth myth, myth is fostering recruitment hubs are not a sustainable model for recruitment. Now, I suppose we don't know the answer to that yet, but we can we can say some things about it, can't we, Anya? Yeah, for sure. I was going to say, can't necessarily say no, because that's the whole point of testing it. Um, and the North East will be going live um, towards the end of the month. So they're also yet to find out kind of whether it works or not. But I guess it's about thinking about it as a test. You know, it's a, it's testing, it's iterating, it's looking at what works. Um, we'd be lying if we said 
they are sustainable, but that's part of this. And I don't think DFE is expecting um, us to all be saying, yes, this is going to be perfect. I think they want to learn and they want to understand from different regions how it works, what might be a challenge in one region might not be in another. Um, so I think, yeah, it will remain to be seen, um, but similar things have been done, done in other places. I'm sure Mark can reflect on um, the RAA programme, but I think, yeah, it's about testing and it's about looking at what works and what doesn't, and that's not gonna be the same in every region, but I think going in with that open mind and, and working together um, is, is the key for this really. Yeah, and I'm sure Mark will, oh, go Mark, go ahead. Um, I uh, think having spent a lot of my career in between the centre of government, particularly DfE and local authorities and independent providers. Uh, a lot of what ch the change we see that's kind of forced upon local authorities is actually change that was already in the local authorities' gift. But given everything else that's going on, um, it's sometimes difficult to see the benefit. Um, what we what we're seeing in the RA program, and of course, we need to be really clear how the RA program um, was enforced by legislation. And what the department said was, if you don't go into an RIA, we're going to take your adoption services off you. <laughs> so that's a really different place to where we are with this. Um, but I actually think where we are with this um, is is where we should have been with RIAs. Um, but it it's a much healthier place because what we're saying is. There is benefit in coming together, um, benefit which I assure you, you will see when you get there and that collectively you'll want to maintain, perhaps not in its full sense, but certainly lots of elements of it. Um, because RIAs uh, are still in their infancy, but the benefits they see far outweigh what was written in the policy document. Um, so going on the journey, uh, and seeing the benefits, I think, will encourage many local authorities to stay together whilst tweaking it. Uh, because, of course, what will this look like alongside your RIA? What will this look like alongside regional care cooperatives, if anyone ever puts their hand up to have a go? Um, what will it look like in terms of other uh, shared services across local authority boundaries? And what will it mean outside of children's services? What we saw in the RA programme was the first example of children's service leaders, services leaders coming together and actively working across local authority boundaries in a way that we hadn't seen before. Um, and it's exciting. Uh, and so I think some of that excitement will help with the sustainability as well as the funding till 2025. Um, but let's be really clear, we haven't got enough foster carers for the children with the most complex needs. Uh, we predict we'll have fewer in the future if we carried on with the same trend. So we have to do something different and we're gonna to have to sustain the way in which we do something different. Yeah, and I think that that that, that will be an argument when you're talking to your, your finance directors, I think, because it this is about more foster carers, and more well-trained, well-prepared foster carers. So if that's done well, then there is definitely a sustainable future for these hubs. So I'm I I'm I'm very optimistic about this. I think this is the um this is a great opportunity for everybody. So our final myth, um, myth number seven, once we submit, so this is a bit more about the process of bidding, but again, we've been asked this question. Once we submit our bid as a local authority cluster, nothing can be changed. I think this is probably mainly for you, Anya, on this. So what's What's your thoughts on that? Um, well, definitely things can be changed. I think there are certain things that that need to stay consistent and, you know, will need to be met, particularly from DfE's perspective. So obviously, you know, coming within that, that funding envelope when you're submitting your bid and then that funding is not going to change. Um, also, the lead local authority, for example, it's important to have that consistency um, as you move into kind of implementation and go live. Um, but definitely you're, you're going to be iterating and there's there's going to be things that you submit in your bid um, that when you start to try and implement them just don't work exactly as you'd you'd thought. So again, speaking to the Northeast, one of the, the things they, they pointed out was how much their governance changed from kind of the governance that they 
set up at the beginning and what they thought that was going to look like and how that was going to work and then actually the the working groups they really needed and the the groups of people they really needed around the table um so something like that they, they set up a project board with quite senior staff and actually what ended up happening was that there were so many levels of governance that it was making it challenging to just make those key decisions um so they slightly scaled that back um but that took that took time and it took getting it not quite right the first time um and similarly with staffing so they um they identified a staffing structure and the, the sorts of people that they wanted in their recruitment hub and when it came to recruitment actually um they had more people um more social workers apply than fostering assistance that they were also looking for so they again adapted and they didn't want to lose good people who were passionate about um working in the hub so they they recruited the people and they you know they've they've iterated their approach so there's definitely things that are going to change and they're going to change over time um and you're going you know having those governance processes and the right people engaged so that you can understand what is and isn't working and, and measuring things um when you when you're implementing your hub will be important but definitely don't think that every single uh word in your bid is going to look exactly the same in practice because um it definitely won't and again dfe know that and that's part of this process i had a um I had a boss years ago who who always insisted, you know, we have a plan for everything, which is absolutely right. But he always said the only thing you know for certain is that the plan is wrong. And that is that is um I think that's a truism. But I think on this, what I know what DFE wants to see is a convincing case, a convincing vision and case for the the your hub in your area, what it will look like, and particularly what what costs are required for that. Um, in terms of implementation, there needs to be a convincing plan, but it can change. And I know that there's an appreciation that we're all on a learning journey together. And so there's, there is room for conversation as we go through the programme about what needs to change, what needs to tweak. But, but certainly I think it's that it's having that vision and it's having that sense of what the costs are. That's an important, important part of this. Mark, any any thoughts from your perspective on that, from the maybe from the RAA program? Well, yeah, but also from just the way in which we lead change. The really interesting thing about bidding for funding money from the centre of government is that they send out some questions and you have some boxes and you've got to put the right words in to get the money. But you also come at that bidding process from what you know at that point, um, often doing things the way in which you've always done them. Uh, when actually what this whole program is about is thinking outside of the box, taking the best of what we do, but also doing it differently. And we don't know that unless you've co-produced your bid and spent months and months kind of doing all of the thinking before you do the bid, you don't get to do the actual work until afterwards when you've started. Um, and I would just implore all of you to not be constrained and have an open mind and just recruit as many brilliant foster carers from as diverse backgrounds as you can find them and keep them from as long as possible by making them happy and feeling really good about the difference they make to children and young people and care leavers. Um, and um, don't worry too much about the boxes, worry about the people and the relationships. <laughs> and I, I think that's right. And, this is a step into the unknown. And I also think, so we had a question in about the, um, just really making the point, is a comment really, making the point that there's a transition that needs to happen from the existing relationship. So you'll need a new hub website. Um, you'll need a new staffing. You need new marketing approach. And all that will will need to happen while you're sort of switching across from what you do now. So I think that's very much appreciated. And I guess this is action learning, the setup of these these hubs, because even though the Northeast have gone first, they're not live yet. So we're all working out what's happening. And I'm sure there'll be, you know, what we will do is pull together some of those lessons and give people an opportunity to talk to each other. And as Mark has pointed out in the RAA programme, an RAA leaders group was a really powerful way of, of, of learning and sharing as those um organizations or those services have have matured and john on that point just to really kind of um push it i suppose right from the outset um 
is that attendance at those meetings from around the country in person, uh, particularly before COVID, but since COVID and everyone traveling around again, was always nearly 100% because people found the support from each other, the peer support um, and the problem solving um, and the collaboration really, really powerful and they didn't want to miss anything. And it'd be good to get that right for this program. So people have a space that's about helping them in a place where you feel safe to be able to kind of chuck some ideas around and to think some of this through. Um, it's really, really important and it is a major enabler to the success of the RA programme. Thank you. I'm going to bring us to a close at that point and just say um, thank you all for your time. So we've um, we've thank you for your questions too. So those we didn't get to, we will answer afterwards. Um, I think it's important to remember the purpose of this work and the ambition to achieve better outcomes for children. So any any other questions, please talk with my colleagues. Um, the We'll share a recording of this webinar afterwards um, for those that weren't able to attend. And the next in the series of events, we're going to hold around putting foster carers at the centre of your hub and what that means in practice and what that means in relationships. So we'll hear from Mark again on that. And we'll be in touch with details. Any other suggestions? We're always open for questions or comments or anything we can do to help you. So please let us know and please let your coaches know. So finally, just to say thank you to our panellists, to Mark and Anya for their time. And thank you for you for joining us. Have a good week. <laughs>